Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you again for this opportunity to just come here once again to just worship you. We thank you again for all that you do for us. As I mentioned this morning, as we're celebrating the first day of spring, as we get ready to prepare to see your creation come to life with all the blooms and the green grass and all the flowers, and just as life starts to come forward, we know that true life can only come through Jesus for those who receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. That that's the only way for people to have true life. That just like with springtime, people need to turn to Jesus, their, their creator. And Father, we ask that you bless this service. Be with your speaker tonight as I present what needs to be said and pray for any Jews that might be listening that they'll turn to you and away from Judaism. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we're going to be doing this be false religion of Judaism part two. I'm going to finish it up tonight here, so I'm going to move along, but the false religion of Judaism part two. For those who may not be aware, Judaism is J-U-D-A-I-S-M, so in case you're wondering you know how to spell it, it can be a little difficult sometimes. So I'm going to pick up um, kind of where I left off last week. Last week I finished up talking about some of the different sects. You know, I mentioned some of the modern ones, some of the ones from the biblical days, and then some in between the different ones. But now we're going to look at that uh, Jews worship in synagogues, and the leaders are called rabbis. Now, Jews were never intended to have synagogues. God gave them first the tabernacle, and then the temple. And worship was to have been done at the temple in Jerusalem. As time went by, especially after the dividing of Israel into the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, then synagogues became important as the northern tribes were forbidden from going to the temple in Jerusalem by the evil kings. The Jews will rebuild the temple during the tribulation and will restart animal sacrifices. But that's where basically your synagogues, you know, the local synagogues originally came from. But they were never intended by God to ever really have these synagogues. You know, it wasn't like to be like a church on every corner. It wasn't be, you know, have synagogues on every corner. But they, you know, that's what it's kind of become. But, you know, they were never really intended to have those synagogues. But the temple will be, you know, remember there's been two temples so far. You had the original one under King Solomon. Now we... They got destroyed by the Babylonians. They rebuilt it. And you know, then they kind of renamed it as the Zubarol Temple or King Herod's Temple. And uh, in fact, Herod's the one I was trying to think of this morning. And so anyway, then um, you know, then that one got destroyed in AD 70. You know, but there, you know, Herod had added on to the temple and so forth, but it was never had the glory of the original first temple under Solomon. But you know, they had, they've had the two temples, but well, they're gonna have a third temple. It's going to get rebuilt during the Great Tribulation. Once they sign that treaty with the Antichrist that starts the seven years of the Tribulation, then the Jews are going to rebuild the temple. They already have everything ready to go. There was already been people over the years that have tried to get in there and mount the temple mount and try to tear things down and start, a, start rebuilding it, and then they get arrested by the Jewish authorities that are, that are atheistic or whatever. But... They have all the, the implements and everything that need to be put in the temples. They have they even they have the red heifer. They have all everything that needs to be ready to go. They just need to have the temple rebuilt. But all, all the um, the candlesticks, the, the the you know everything they have, you know that except for the ark of the covenant, which even that I believe they have that. It's hidden. They're just not revealing it until it's time to be revealed. But. Uh, the thing is, you know, that's going to happen. It's going to happen. There will be a third one. And then during midway tribulation, then the Antichrist is going to desecrate the uh, temple. And then there will be a fourth temple that will get built uh, during the millennial kingdom or reign of Jesus. Which is going to be a lot bigger. It's actually going to take up the entire temple mount. And just as a side note, because it has nothing to do with this, maybe I'll preach on it sometime, but... You know, everybody thinks you've got to tear down. You know, they always say that on the Temple Mount you can't be rebuilt because you've got the Dome of the Mosque there. And so, you know, you start this Third World War and all this kind of stuff, World War III and everything. No, that's not where it is. The, the Temple can be rebuilt and you cannot even ever touch the, the Dome of the Mosque. It's off to the side. It's not the same location. So, you know, besides even if that's the case, if God wanted to do it, they'll just have an earthquake and have the whole thing fall apart, destroy, whatever. 
I mean, Especially. it's going to happen, whether exactly how it's going to happen, but the point is, the, the, the real location is off to the side, so it, it doesn't even have to be, uh, it's not even where, where the dome of the mosque is right now. But anyway, so then, like I said, they're going to rebuild it during the tribulation, and we'll restart these animal sacrifices. And I can't wait to hear, you know, if, well, I don't plan on being there, but if, uh, I'd love to hear what Peter has to say about that. But since the Jews have not had a temple since 80, 70, cannot perform animal sacrifices to what they believe remove their sins, they have made works as the way of salvation. And that's the way it is still today. You know, all false religions have works as the way to heaven. And Judaism is no different. Now, Jews are forbidden to mention the name of Jesus or to learn about him. Now, the name Jesus is Yeshua in Hebrew. It's Y-E-S-H-U-A. Now, family members will often punish another one who is caught reading the New Testament or talking about Jesus. You know, especially like if they're ultra-Orthodox or something like that. But I mean, again, as I said this morning, even in Israel, then it is very difficult to, to try to witness for Jesus. You know, you can be persecuted just as much in, in Israel as you can in other places. You know, don't think that, oh, well, they're a civilized nation, you know, that, that you're not going to get persecuted. You go in there and start trying to preach Jesus, especially to certain groups, and you might find your life in danger. Now, when one gets saved, they are usually shunned by the rest of the family as a traitor to Judaism. You know, we've seen that mentioned before with, with Muslims and so forth, and, or the Hindus are the ones, but, you know, Judaism is no different. They, they, as I said, if you become a uh, Messianic Jew, you know, a Jew that believes in Jesus as a Savior, they don't even consider you as part of Judaism. I mean, you're, you're, you're not one of them or anything else, so... You're one of us. Right, but, I mean... Messianic yeah, Jews believe they're still part of Judaism or whatever. But Judaism does retain some of the beliefs of Christianity, such as the worship of one God, the Genesis account of creation, and other stories and beliefs. So, you know, it's not they haven't thrown everything out. The problem is they have thrown some stuff out, but they, a lot of it's just they've added. You know, they're, they're big on adding things, and then the one big thing they've thrown out is Jesus, of course. But many liberal Jews accept evolution. So, you know, they, are, they do, you know, as, as a whole, I mean, in one sense, believe in the count of creation, but at the same time, there's a lot of the liberal Jews that, that accept evolution. But Judaism, just like Christianity, is a monotheistic religion, and both claim rightfully descent from Abraham. You know, we've seen that before, but, you know, both rightfully come from Abraham. So, you know, that, that, that part's correct. Now, Judaism differs in the rejection of the New Testament as well as in the rejection of the Godhead, you know, the Trinity. You know, they only believe, they don't believe in, you know, that Jesus is, is God's Son and so forth. You know, so they reject, you know, the Godhead. And, of course, they reject the entire New Testament. Now, Judaism denies Jesus is God, as well as being the Son of God and their Messiah, or, you know, the Messiah. Now, Jesus, I mean, uh, Judaism denies the Holy Ghost is a person. Now remember, some of the Jewish believers in the Old Testament rightfully believe the same as we do, but that Judaism is a distortion of what God gave to the Jewish people and is a false religion. You know, again, remember the, the true people like Moses or the prophets or stuff? They weren't believing, they weren't members of Judaism. I showed you Judaism actually came about after the death of Jesus. And, you know, it already been getting distorted long before that basically from the Babylonian times, you know, and so forth, and even before that. But, you know, your true believers, they were never true Judaism, you know, a member of, of Judaism religion. You know, they were saved people just like you and I are. You know, they weren't any more part of Judaism than we are. But if Judaism accepts the Old Testament, which they refer to as the Talmud, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, uh, as the Tanakh, and then they also accept the, the Talmud, and then various rabbis and traditions for their beliefs while rejecting the New Testament. So, you know, they, 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 they agree with us that they accept the Old Testament, but the problem is then they also add in the Talmud, which I mentioned last week, you know, and then various traditions and beliefs of different rabbis. And then, of course, they reject the New Testament. 
And Judaism has rejected some of the things in the Old Testament. Judaism agrees with Christianity by believing man was created in God's image and man is fallen due to Adam's sin and needs salvation. But the problem is they think you get your salvation by doing all these good works and you know they thought it was the animal sacrifice but now they can't do that so now it's all the good works and so forth. You know I've kind of mentioned some of that in some of my sermons on like uh, uh, the Damn torment, some of those like that, stuff like that. So, but I mentioned you know, in, the, in the Old Testament how they reject some. I mean, for example, they throw out Psalm 53 or any of the prophecies that have to deal with Jesus. You know, for the most part, they throw that kind of stuff out. And, you know, and I mentioned how a lot of it they just kind of skim over. You know, there's a lot of it don't get read, you know, so much. It's mostly the first five books. What is the Talmud? The Talmud, that, that is sayings and, and uh, beliefs of like different rabbis that they came up with. That they, they um, it's broken up into two parts. Where one one part is all these these traditions. It's kind of like the Roman Catholics have their traditions. Well, the same thing there. They take a bunch of their traditions, put them all in this book, and then they have another part of the book which I would go and interpret those tr uh, traditions. You know, the rabbis or whatever. You know, then they would go and interpret the, them, and then they wrote them down, and then those interpretations along with traditions make up. Together, the two parts make up what's known as the Talmud. So, you know, obviously it's stuff that's totally on Scripture and everything. You know, they, they put it on equal level with, with the Old Testament. In fact, a lot of times that actually overrides the Old Testament. You know, that's what Jesus was condemning. They basically, for all intents and purposes, had the Talmud in the days of Jesus. They just didn't have it in written form, but they had it in oral, historical form. And that's what Jesus would condemn them. He's like, you know, they were going around, and I told you how they were adding to the Sabbath. All these things you can't do. And Jesus never said, I didn't say you couldn't do that on the Sabbath. You know, you guys add to it. You know, there's things about washing their hands. And he was like, well, it's not your hands that are filthy. It's what goes into, you know, goes into your mouth. I mean, comes out of your mouth. It's not what goes into you, but what comes out of you. So, you know, they were trying to add all these things. And, you know, that's basically what the Talmud is. It's all those things then out of written form. Say again? Rules. Yeah, yeah. They were under all these rules that God never, you know... Made up. I mean, they added things that God never said. But as I said, so you know, in Judaism, sin is disobeying the laws of the Old Testament. You know, they they're so much. You know, they're hung up on the the Ten Commandments, and and you know, and it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's those things I was just talking about. All these laws that the rabbis made up. All these different laws that are had nothing that God never endorsed. Then now they're saying, well, you broke one of those laws, so you just sin. No, oh, it's sin by, I mean, if you go on the Sabbath and turn on a light switch, that's not a sin. That's not work. You know, you're making it work and you're trying to make it sin, but that's not. That's not what God said. So, you know, they're, like I said, they're adding to what God says. And all false religions, cults, things like that, they always do that. And I, I mentioned a while ago how, how the Pharisees, many man-made laws as well. Now, salvation in Judaism is by one's works and obeying biblical and rabbinical laws and will also be by future animal sacrifices. That's why they're so excited that you know so many want the temple again because they want to get these animal sacrifices started again because they're so they're so worried that they need these sacrifices, you know, to shed that blood for their salvation. You know, instead of realizing they need to just turn to Jesus, who would already paid the price of the Passover lamb. So you know, I mean, their, their idea is, you know, they believe in salvation, but their idea of how to get saved is not scriptural. You know, again, so it's a, it's a false religion. Now, Judaism has not only added to God's word with the Talmud, but has made tradition of more importance than the word of God. Judaism rejects the New Testament and Jesus and has minimized much of the Old Testament as well. Now, I mentioned how works have become the way of salvation, and Jews look forward to the day that the temple is rebuilt and Adam and sacrifice restarted. Sacrifices will never save you, only the blood of Jesus. Let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. So, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Try to pick it up. It's a little bit quicker, but 
trying to get everything in, but still trying to... Hebrews what? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. So Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. You know, and if you actually read all through Hebrews, it shows you over and over again how, you know, Jesus made one sacrifice for all time, and, you know, it tells you this stuff over and over, how the animal sacrifices will never do anything. So it's clear that the animal sacrifices, you know, they're not going to save you. It's only the blood of Jesus. They've cheated their self by not believing. Well, exactly. I mean, they, they want to, you know, all people try to, instead of taking the gospel, which is simple, they always want to make it difficult. And, and that's the thing. They can't accept it because, that you know, people, they, they think they have to do something. Well, that's the whole point. You can't do it. You cannot do anything. You know, Jesus has done all the work for us. Now, all false religions have work for their salvation. Now, Scripture says we are saved by grace through faith, not works. A person's faith must be placed in Jesus, not themselves. Now, again, I read this every time. If you guys want to turn there quickly, you can, but otherwise I'm going to go ahead and read it. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 8 and 9. Like I said, you guys know what I read it all the time. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, and is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, most Jews, in reality, know very little about what is in Scripture, you know, what we would refer to as the Old Testament. And most do not care to know. You know, I think in all fairness, Christians aren't much better. A lot of them don't know anything, don't care to think either. So. But, you know, that's not really the point right now. But, but the day will come at the end of the tribulation that the remaining one-third of Jews who are still alive will all be saved. I've read this before, but go to Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. So Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Just second book to the end of the Old Testament, right before Malachi. So Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. But remember, two-thirds of all the Jews, when the tribulation starts, two-thirds of all those Jews will end up being killed and die and go to hell for... The tribulation's over. You know, but one third of them are going to, you know, we'll be a little bit more than that because a few of those probably get saved. But, you know, one third of those will be saved. So the entire nation was saved at the very end when they see Jesus coming. So Zechariah chapter 13, 8 and 9. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine it as silver is refined. And will try them as gold is tried. They shall call my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. So when they see Jesus coming, whom they've pierced, you know, there's other scriptures that talk about that too. They'll clearly finally see that Jesus is their Messiah. And then going through the fire, that's the whole seven-year tribulation. That's what it's referring to there. But now Jews have little hope for salvation and they only hope they will get to heaven. You know, that's how everybody is. Well, I hope I get there someday. I hope I was good enough. Or, you know, you hear that all the time. But by trusting what God taught Moses, they could know they will go to heaven if they trust and believe in Jesus. Judaism has distorted God's word so that today Jews have no assurance of going to heaven. Now, Scripture says that those who trust in Jesus as their Savior can know they will go to heaven. You know this one too, but turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. You know, I read some of these verses a lot, but that's because they're all relevant and they're important. So, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Okay, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, a lot of the new Bibles, they take out that last section, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, they'll take that right out. What verse did you say? Was that? What verse? That's 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> John, not, not gospel, John. No. Due to Judaism's hatred for Jesus, they have intentionally dropped years from their calendar. 
The Jewish calendar is supposed to be based off of the date of creation, yet many years were dropped so it would not match up with Jesus. Their calendar in 2022 is the year 5,778, when it should be just under 6,000. You know, I've said that before, but you know, we're just under 6,000 years. It's not long that Jesus can return, and then 6,000 years will start the millennium. But they purposely took off, you know, close to 200 years, or probably a little more than that, whatever, to, so that you, it would not match up with, with Jesus. So, you know, you have, the connection would not be there. But many of the Jewish feasts have had customs added to them by the Jews over the years that God never ordained. You know, I've, been, I've preached on you, you know, you guys over time, the, the different Jewish feasts. And they'll keep some of the stuff, but they always add a lot of other stuff to them as well, or take out some stuff that they're supposed to, or different things like that. So, you know, again, they're adding to what God wants. You know, that's what false religions and things do. Now, in summary, Judaism is a false religion as it adds to God's Word, the Talmud, as well as removes from God's Word, the New Testament, and salvation is by works, and Judaism rejects Jesus as her Messiah. Now, the next thing we want to look at is, somebody asked me about this before, and I didn't give too much of an answer because I knew I'd be preaching on this at some point, but the Star of David is the symbol used for Israel in Judaism, and it's on the flag of Israel. If you look at the flag of Israel, it's white and blue, like two blue stripes, and it's got the big Star of David on it. Now, the Star of David is made up of two triangles overlapping, with one pointing up that supposedly represents God, and one pointing down that supposedly represents man. You know, it's two triangles like this, and then, you know, they overlap. Now, this symbol is not from God, and God never gave it to the Jewish people to use. In fact, God condemned its use. This again shows that Judaism is a false religion. It's again, they, they're adding stuff and, you know, doing things that are unscriptural and so forth. Now, these verses may be speaking of the symbol being used by the Jews, or at least a similar one. This, I'm going to read you some verses here, or in a minute here, but the star represented false gods worshipped by the Jews and their neighbors. Now, Solomon married many wives that worshipped these false gods. Remember, he had... Uh, what was it, uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines, or uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines, whatever, one or the other. I think it was 300. 300 wives and 700 concubines. A guy for smart, being the wisest man on earth, as far as I'm concerned, he was pretty darn stupid. I mean, anybody that wants that many women around you, you're, you're, you're dumb. You got problems, dude. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you can't please hard enough to please one woman, let alone try to please a thousand of them, so. But, uh, How old did he live today? What's that? How old did he live today? Scripture doesn't say. I mean, probably about 70, somewhere around there. Probably about the same age as David, but we don't, it doesn't really say. Uh, I mean, we know he ruled for 40 years, and it doesn't say, you know, how old he was when he, when he took over. But, you know, he was probably at least in his 20s or 30s or somewhere else. So, he, he, you know, around that age probably when he died. But, I mean, seriously, you know, it's just, even if... God allowed you to have all these women, you know, to be your wives. Why would you want so many wives and stuff? I mean, being lucky, like, okay, what was your name again? Start wearing name tags, people. I don't know who you are, you know. But, you know, all these women had all these, um, they worshipped all these false, false gods. I mean, he had all these women that were not even, not even Israelites. They were, they were women from other nations that he was marrying to try to make paths. Instead of trusting in God for his security, he was married just like royalty does now. They'll marry you know, somebody from another nation, and so then they, they go and they try to, you know, think they're going to have peace and all this kind of stuff. Well, true peace only comes from Jesus, but, you know, he, he built um, idols, I mean, um, altars and different things for their false gods and did all this stuff, and so, uh, anyway, you know, like I said, so Solomon married many wives that worshiped these false gods. Now, sometimes the Star of David is associated with Solomon, which makes sense as he had been influenced by false gods. You know, I think it probably is, comes from Solomon and all his idolatrous wives. But the seal of Solomon is believed to have been nothing more than the talisman of Saturn. You know, of course, Saturn was one of the Roman gods, you know, that was... Uh, 
I don't remember what he was the, supposedly the god of, but he was, um, I think, supposed to be the dad of Jupiter and, and I don't know, whatever. He was a false god. But Satanists and Freemasons love Solomon. Solomon is like the man in Freemasonry. You know, that ought to tell you something because when Satanists and, and, and uh, Freemasons, you know, it shows you that how affected he, Solomon had been by, by uh, Satan. You know, I'm not telling you he wasn't a saved man, but he was definitely affected by Satan and under, under the influence of Satan. I mean, you don't get involved with that many satanic women and not be influenced by Satan. That's a scary spirit. Right, that's what I'm saying. When you're, all these women are, are uh, connected to all these false gods and worshiping them and all this stuff. And, you know, the thing is, you're, he can get sucked into it. You know, that was the problem. He, God said, if you, if you turn away from that stuff, I would, you know, if you stay, don't stay worshiping me, I'll give you a long life. Well, he didn't get that long life because he turned to all these false gods and goddesses. And like I said, he became part of, you know, the worship of them and, and, and stuff himself. But turn to, I want you to look at a couple verses here to talk about some of this stuff. Turn to Amos chapter 5, verse 26. Amos chapter 5, verse 26. But you know, that was that was the downfall of, of Satan himself, I mean of Solomon himself, was all these women. You know, we see in the scripture how the wickedest people in scripture were always the women, like Jezebel and so forth. Then it was uh, Amos chapter 5 and verse 26. You know, women, women always are influencing these men, and you see it throughout history and stuff. And but Amos chapter 5, verse 26. But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Chion your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourself. Now, of course, Moloch and Chion were false gods. I don't remember, I'd have to look it up, which one Moloch was, I don't remember who worshipped, you know, what, he was the god of like the Ammonites, I think, or something, and I don't remember the Chion. Anyway, they're all false gods. And then look up Acts chapter 7, verse 43. But if you noticed in that verse, it talks about the star of your God. And then Acts chapter 7, verse 43. You know, I mean, I do believe that Solomon probably was a saved individual, but I think he got so far away from God that, that uh, you know, he, he lost a lot of what he could have had. But Acts chapter 7, verse 43. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rephaim, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So again, he's, you're talking about Israelite here, the, the Israelites. And, you know, in this case it was Judah. But you see again, Moloch mentioned, and then the star of your god Rephaim. You know, and they worship these these uh, these gods. It does seem that God may be given us a clue that Solomon may have used the hexagram for sinful worship as he collected the same amount of gold annually as the number of the beast in Revelation. The, the Star of David is what's known as a hexagram. It's six-sided in the way the shape is. It's known as a hexagram. But the, the same amount of gold he collected annually was matched the number of the beast in Revelation. Most people miss this, but turn to 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. So 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 14. Okay, 1 James chapter 10, verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600, three score, and six talents of gold. Again, the score is 20, so that's 60, 666, or 666. Remember that, talents of gold. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. This will be the Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. 
Of course, this is going to be talking about the, the number on the mark of the beast, which everyone knows is, they always refer to it as 666, but really it's 666, which we just saw here in 1 Kings 10, 14. But notice it's going to say the exact same thing. Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. So it's the same exact phrase. Six hundred three score and six. Now I do not believe that it is a coincidence that Solomon is connected to the mark of the beast. Again, if he's influenced by Satan through all these false women and gods, you know, I mean, they're uh, women with their false gods and goddesses, you're going to be under that influence for sure. And again, we also know that you know, money is the root of all evil. What's gold? It's, it's money and it's an extremely expensive item. And he had more gold than anybody. But now remember, the Roman Catholic Church which will give us the Antichrist, you know, which I believe will be the Pope, or either the Black Pope, either the White or the Black Pope, uses the same symbol. The papal mitre even has the symbol on it, as do many Roman Catholic churches and other things in Roman Catholicism. So there's, uh, the, you see that it's not just Judaism, that you know, the Roman Catholic Church uses the Star of David as well. You know, the, the mitre is that, pointy fish, fish hat that the Pope wears. And that's exactly what it is. It represents the fish god Nagon. You know, like I said, they're, they're uh, a false religion. You know, they're a cult. I never saw one. But um, anyway, so like I said, so it's not just the Judaism. Now the Star of David is nothing more than a hexagram which is used by Satanists, Luciferians, witches, Freemasons, astrologers, New Agers, other occultists and the Roman Catholic Church, whose Pope will be the Antichrist, as well as by Mormons and others. Of course, the Mormons are very much connected with the Freemasonry and everything as well, just like Roman Catholicism. So we see that this uh, Star of David is connected to very evil stuff. So, you know, it, it is not, has nothing to do with Israel or the religion, you know, what God gave to the Israelites. Now, the fact that even the Roman Catholic Church uses the Star of David shows it is not a Jewish symbol. You know, they'll come up with a reason where they say, oh, well, it means this and that. You know, everybody always has, has the reasons, but they're all false and lies. But no scripture backs up David using it. So by calling it the Star of David, it's just a way to deceive people about the true origin and meaning of it. Again, if you call it the Star of David, everybody thinks David was great. But if you called it the Star of Solomon, which is probably more realistically where it came from, which actually was really even around before that because it came from these false gods that we read in these verses from Moloch, Cheon, and Rephan. But, you know, he's probably the one that kind of made it a thing of Israel, if you want to say. But, you know, they give it the name of Star of David because everybody, you know, thinks highly of David where, you know, Solomon... You know, they don't, want, they don't want the connection being seen to Freemasonry and Satanism and all this other stuff. So they're not going to call it the Star of Solomon. But the Star of David is essentially a double pyramid, which is highly representative in Freemasonry, which is nothing more than Satanism in disguise. You know, as I said, it's, it's a, a pyramid in a pyramid. You know, it's just a double pyramid. Now, many secular Jews have been Freemasons, or belong to other satanic organizations such as the Illuminati that are working on bringing in the New World Order. The Star of David consists of six points, six triangles, six sides of the hexagon, and represents the number of the beast, which is 666. Again, if you look at, if you study Satanism and Freemasonry, we're going to look at some of that stuff, but if you study, you know, pay attention to anything. Just start paying attention to people on TV and stuff. Then you'll see, you know, it's no coincidence why things have six of this or six of that. It's because they're trying to, like this year, six points, six triangles, six sides. They're trying to represent the number 666, which is the mark of the beast. You know, because they're, they're, they're trying to promote Satan himself. You know, they're not doing it because they think, you know, that it's evil. 
Now, the six-pointed star is always satanic. Most stars, if you, if you notice, they're, they're five-pointed. You know, of course, if you take the five-pointed star and you flip it upside down so that the point's on the bottom, now you're, you're into Satanism. You know, that's the... That's the, the um, can't think what you call that. But the, uh, anyway, that's what Satanists and all them use. That, you know, that, that represents the horns and so forth of Satan. You flip it over. But, you know, we, the six-pointed star is always Satanic. Now, Satanists use the star of David to represent 666, so it is not speculation. As I said, we repeat that. Satanists use the star of David to represent 666. So it's not me speculating. This is what it means. I mean, this is, that is what it means. The Star of David is used by witches to call devils. In fact, witches are said to place a hex, I said, quote, hex, which is nothing, you know, a curse, on people. And this saying comes from hexagram. That's why they refer to it as a hex, because it comes from the fact that the Star of David is a hexagram. And when they place a curse, you know, that they short, everybody wants to short stuff or whatever, instead of saying curse. It's called a hex. Now, some Satanists have said it is necessary to have a hexagram present in order to call for devils. In other words, they have to have the Star of David or whatever present in order for them to be able to call these witches and so forth, the Satanists, to call for devils. Now, the horns of the Freemason god Baphomet, who represents Satan, can be seen on the points of the top triangle, which points downward. Now, I mentioned how the two triangles are supposed to represent God and man. This is similar to in Freemasonry, where Baphomet points up and down. He points up and down like this or whatever. And they say, the, uh, uh, as above, so below. You know, that's, that's the saying they say. Now, that saying was actually put in the uh, message Bible. They actually put that in the Lord's Prayer. And it took out, you know, where it says, as in heaven, you know, as in, um, um, as in heaven and on earth or whatever. I can't even, my head, my mind's going blank right now. But anyway, you know, they replaced that, you know, took that out and say, as above, so below. You know, like I said, it's clearly, this is talking about Satan stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, uh, something to be in the scripture for sure. So again, it shows that's a false Bible. But this reference is Satan, not God. Now, mystical Kabbalist Jews in the Dark Ages are known to have used the Star of David. These Jews were into the occult. Now, the Jewish Rothschild family, of whom most were Satanists, there's still many around today. They are like filthy rich people that run, you know, a lot of them have, are, are part of the people that are helping run this, set up this New World Order has a long connection with the New World Order and their family symbol is a red hexagram and they are controlled by the Jesuits and they control much of the world's finances. You know, most of the money is controlled by them throughout the world, you know, their, their family. Now, Israel today is secretly controlled by the Roman Catholic Jesuits who are bringing in the New World Order and control the world's wealth. This is one of the reasons for the Star of David on the national flag as well as the fact that many of the Jewish leaders are Freemasons and Illuminati, members of the Illuminati. Now, the Star of David is placed on Jewish synagogues. This is supposedly done to mask the Christian cross, but in reality marks them as servants of Satan and Judaism as a false religion. So again, when you see the Star of David, you know, don't try to tell, well, that represents Judaism. It might represent Judaism, but it doesn't represent the religion or the, you know, the, what God gave to the Israelite people. It is a false satanic symbol that represents a false religion. Now because Israel and the Jews have rejected Jesus, God has blinded them since the death and resurrection of Jesus until his second coming. Let's quickly look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 through 16. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Verses 13 through 16. We'll be finishing up here in this part in closing. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. 
and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now this does not mean that individual Jews cannot be saved as many have. But the Jewish people as a whole are spiritually blind. And like I said, they're going to remain spiritually blind until the very end of the tribulation. When they see Jesus coming, then those one-third that I just read to you will finally be spiritually, have their eyes opened up. And they'll finally realize that Jesus is recital. Have that blind, you know, removed from them. But God intentionally put that blind there because of the rejection of Jesus. And, you know, like I said, but that doesn't mean if someone's truly searching, including a, a Jewish person, if they're truly searching for Jesus as the Messiah, then Jesus will open, you know, remove that veil and they can turn to Jesus and get saved. But they rejected Jesus because they listened to their religious leaders and followed tradition rather than the word of God and recognizing that the Messiah was in front of them in Jesus. You know, it's, again, they, put, they use what we would say is the Talmud now, the traditions of the Pharisees, Instead of opening up scripture, they listen to what them, you know, their, their false rules and so forth like that, and rejecting what scripture says. If they had read scripture, they would have known when Jesus walked in there on Palm Sunday, they would have known to the very day that that was their Messiah walking in. And then they turned around and crucified him, just like scripture says. When I plead with any Jews that may be listening to search out the whole of scripture in the Old and New Testaments, and see how Jesus fulfilled all the Messianic prophecies. You may go to my website at www.jesusisgodandlordministries.com and look under the section for Precious Jewish Souls for more information, including a listing of many of the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. You will see there were hundreds of prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus at His first coming, and you know, over 300 on his first coming, and it's going to be over 900 at his second coming. And every one was filled, fulfilled right to the exact T and letter. You know, there was nothing missing. You know, there's no doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, and he is our Lord and Savior. Now, precious Jewish soul, you must realize that Judaism is a dead and false religion that will not save you. And being Jewish will not save you either. It's because you're the chosen people. You still have to get, get saved just like everybody else. You know, nor will your works or sacrifice of animals or fulfilling the feast. You, know, you can do all these things and it will never save you if you do not ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You must admit that you are a sinner. We have all broken the Ten Commandments. You know, everybody's told a lie. Everybody's lusted after something or, you know, wish they, uh, you know, had something that belonged to somebody else, coveted something, or, you know, everybody's uh, used the Lord's name in vain or something. You know, everybody has at some point broken multiple of those, if not all of those commandments. But that's it. You must admit that you are a sinner as we have all broken the Ten Commandments. And then realize that you cannot save yourself and need a Savior, and that that Savior is Jesus. Jesus was a Jew, and he was one of you. Jesus was a Jewish person. He still is a Jewish person. So, you know, you're rejecting your own. It's not even like, well, I don't want to worship somebody else. And you're not worshiping somebody else. You're worshiping this man that was a Jew who is none other than God himself incarnate. Now, he is, Jesus is not an evil man, as Jewish religious leaders have taught that you are to avoid. You know, don't, don't listen to them. As I said in my sermon in hell, you're the one that's going to have to answer and, and deal with the punishment in hell, not the leaders that have turned you away. Now, only you will answer before God for your decision, not the religious leaders, your family, or friends, as they will answer for themselves. As I said, everybody's going to serve their own time in hell if they reject Jesus as Savior. You know, not your friends aren't going to do it for you, your family, you know, the Jewish rabbis, or anybody else. You know, you reject Jesus, you will 
be in torment and hell yourself all eternity. So call upon Jesus to save you now before it is eternally too late. And then in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, this verse, in one sentence, the gospel in a nutshell, I preached on that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, that means even you, a Jewish person, you know, if you call upon Jesus, you sh should not perish, but have everlasting life. You, you will have everlasting life if you call upon Jesus today. So I, I plead with you today. But let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you for this time you've given us here to once again to study on Judaism. And I do plead with any of those Jews out there that might be listening, that they start looking in Scripture, go to my website or some other things, and sources and just realize you know look at see where Jesus fulfilled all those pro messianic prophecies that he is the Jewish Messiah and their Savior and then ask them to, to have God remove that veil from their eyes so they can see the truth and realize that Jesus is who they need that Judaism is a false religion just like Islam or any other one and will send them on a path to hell that it is only through the shed blood of Jesus that not their works the sacrifices of animals or anything else they do that will, will get them to have only the shed blood of Jesus. And I pray that the, the Jews today, and anybody else that might be listening, even if they're not a Jewish person, that if they're not saved, that today will be the day of salvation, that they'll realize and admit that they're a sinner and call upon Jesus to save them before it's eternally too late. And Father, I do pray for safety for each and every one as they leave here tonight. I pray and thank you uh, thank you for each one that was here. I pray for, that you bless their weeks. Just continue to be with those that we mentioned this morning in the prayers. Uh, put your healing touches on that, that placement that you, uh, we mentioned. And just be with the other placement family. Be with all those that be with Ted and all those on the prayer list. Be with Teddy's family and uh, Paula's cousins and, and Ruth's sister. And just so many of them, Lord, that just need your healing touch. And, be with Glenda and all those, Lord, that just need, need your healing touch. And Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.